Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over bryozoans. Bryozoa is a phylum of invertebrate animals, just like all the other phyla that we've been going over in these invertebrate paleontology videos. And to give a little background over bryozoa, basically they have been around since the early paleozoic, just like most of the other phyla we've been talking about. They are within the group Lophophorate, and this is just because they include what's called a lophophore, which we'll go over what that is a little later. And this phylum is also known as ectoprocta, so if you're confused confused about what bryozoa is, maybe you've heard it in your class as ectoprocta. It means the same thing. And most bryozoans are marine with only one freshwater family of the whole phylum, and they all are filter feeders, and they are all colonial. And if you watch the sponge and cnidarian videos, you probably understand a little bit about coloniality versus a solitary lifestyle. And today we'll be talking a lot more about a colonial lifestyle in the sense of bryozoans because they're all colonial. And this just means that they have a bunch of individuals living in one animal, per se, rather than one individual living as that one animal. <laughs> Imagine all of the cells in our body being different individuals, and that would be kind of like a bryozoan. The bryozoans have colonies that can contain tens of millions of individuals, making up one bryozoan animal. And because bryozoan individuals are so tiny, these structures that these colonies make are hard to study and distinguish from one another without thin sections. So we can see to the left some pictures of examples of bryozoa, like the fossil on the top left, which was the first picture we saw in the title slide that's a fan-ish structure of a bryozoan. We'll see a lot of those when we talk about the classification of these. And then we see the bottom picture, which is kind of the screw-like structure that's part of the Archimedes genus, and that's a really famous index fossil, which we'll get into later as well. And then we have a live modern bryozoan in the top right picture shown here, kind of another fanny structure. However, in a thin section, we can see so much more detail. And so we can see in these thin sections here that there are all these compartments and holes and tubes and shapes and all these structures throughout the zoarium of a bryozoan animal. And we'll talk about what zoarium means later. But I want to stress that in this video, we won't be going really in depth in terms of the thin sections of bryozoans. We're really just going to keep it on the surface level of how to distinguish the different classifications without a microscope. So just by looking with your eyes and their reproduction, their ecology, their evolution, evolution throughout Earth history, etc. And so in later videos, I might get a little bit more detailed in terms of thin sections of all these phyla, but not in this one. So in this slide, we're going to go over a little bit about the anatomy and kind of body structure of these bryozoans. And basically bryozoans, like we said, are colonial. So what this picture is showing is one of the individuals that lives in those colonies. And these individuals are called zooids. And so there are tens of millions of zooids in some of these colonies. And these zooids have a U-shaped digestive track, a lophophore, which we talked about was what classifies them in the lophophorate group. And these lophophores, as shown in the picture here, is this structure that has all these tentacles on it, shown here in the figure to the right. We can see it's labeled as ciliated tentacles, so tentacles with cilia to draw water toward their mouth and therefore filter feed. And it makes sense that their mouth is located in the middle of this lophophore structure so that these ciliated tentacles can draw the currents of water toward their mouth and therefore feed it, give it oxygen, etc. And then it doesn't actually only have one hole for everything, like a lot of the animals we've been talking about so far. So it has an anus as well as a mouth. And so this anus is actually outside of it, the lophophore. We can see located on the right side outside of the lophophore on the picture to the right. And this is actually what gives them their second phylum name, ectoprocta. It means outside anus. So the other characteristics basically that are listed on the slide, of course, are that these zooids have no heart, no vascular system, and no excretory or respiratory tract. So before we move on to some of the other structures in this zooid and how they reproduce, I wanted to just show you a picture of what this zooid would look like in its colony and so how they're all kind of situated with one another in their colony and how they work together to gain food and continue to grow their colony. So this picture shown at the top of the slide is what I wanted to include to kind of show you what this would look like. And now that begs the question, how do these zooids reproduce. So the reproductive organs are within the body cavity of the zooid, and most bryozoan species are bisexual, with both eggs and sperm, which are released to form zygotes and eventually larvae, and these larvae can metamorphose into what's called ancestrula, which then settle to form new colonies if they're lucky, and then zooids can then bud off asexually from the ancestrula. So now that we have a general understanding of their general structure, where the lophophore is, where the mouth is, how they 
filter feed, how they reproduce, and kind of what they look like situated next to each other in a colony, you're probably wondering, yes, I see a simulation of how they might look like, but I kind of can't picture it. I mean, you showed us this picture of a white net looking structure on the previous slide, and we're supposed to believe that that's these little things. Well, to help you visualize it, I've included a couple pictures here. First, zoomed in. This is what these look like in an actual thin section of a bryozoan animal with the scale at the bottom as 100 microns. So this is a very, very zoomed in image where we're looking at each zooid with each zooid opening or autopore, which we'll talk about all the morphological terms for the fossils in the next slide. But basically, we're looking at these holes in these individual zooids, but you probably still can't picture it on an actual fossil with your own eyes when you don't have a microscope. So let's zoom out a little bit more. Okay, or a lot a bit more. <laughs> this is another picture, and this shows a bryozoan animal encrusting this rock. And if we zoom in on the bryozoan, we can see these little holes. These little holes are analogous to what we just saw in the thin section, showing all the little autopores where the zooids would be. And this is really all that there is to bryozoan structure. Of course, there's tons of morphological diversity, which we'll get into on the next slide. But in general, bryozoans are just animals that are a bunch of little capsules with open openings all attached next to each other that make colonies with huge numbers just to become this huge organism. But really, they're, they're just so tiny. And for this reason, sometimes they're mistaken for sponges or certain types of corals. But now we're going to get into kind of how to identify these in fossil form to hopefully prevent you from actually making those mistakes. So here we see how diverse bryozoan morphology can really be. Like I briefly mentioned earlier, the calcareous bryozoan skeletons that get preserved, which are pictured here at the bottom, are called zooaria, or singular zoarium. And these skeletons have zoechia, or autopores, which are the openings that host the zooid individuals, like we saw on the previous slide with those pictures of the real-life examples. Another important thing to remember that we'll see again later when we get into different classes of bryozoans is that even though individuals are technically genetic clones of one another, they sometimes express their genes in very different ways, producing bryozoans with a wide variety of different types of zooids and therefore different structures of openings within their zoarium. And when this happens, this is called polymorphism. And we can see a lot of polymorphism in the fossil record, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Additionally, on this slide, I want to go over a little bit about their structure morphologically in terms of how we label different structures in bryozoan fossils. So in this picture to the bottom left, we see the labeled zoarium, which we just mentioned is the entire calcareous skeleton of the whole animal, and then we have the autopores labeled, and we talked about the autopores being the opening where the zooid lived during the bryozoan's lifetime, and then we have mesopores labeled. Mesopores are what we just mentioned with the polymorphism. You can have different types of zooids, and so when you have different types, you might have the major type being hosted in the autopores, and then whatever is the secondary type of zooid in that colony, you might have different shaped pores for it, and these are called mesopores. And then we have the apertures, decepiments, finistrules, branches, diaphragms, and acanthopores also labeled. And we'll talk about all of these in the coming slides. But before we do, let's talk about the general classification of bryozoans and what we'll be focusing on in this video. So to break it down, we have the class Phylactolemata. I think I'm saying that right. And this is a recent class, so we're really not going to be focusing on this one at all. So sorry if you wanted me to go over that. Um, but yeah, this is just recent, so there's no fossils over it, so paleontology is uh, useless. But we will be discussing the class Stenolemata. This is a really important class because it contains a lot of really distinct orders of bryozoans that are really helpful fossils for reconstructing Earth's history and just as index fossils, etc. So we're going to be talking about Stenolemata. This class includes order Finistrata, which are shown in the examples to the left. It also includes Cryptostomata, Trepostomata, Cyclostomata, then we have Cystoporata, and then the Gymnolemata class listed at the bottom here, not pictured in the slide, but we will show pictures later, contains orders Stenostomata and Chelostomata. So first we'll talk about Trepostomata. Trepostome bryozoans, shown in the figure to the right, lived from the Ordovician to the Triassic, and they're named for their changing mouth. So basically they have three different types of tubes or zoechia or pores as we were talking about them earlier. And these include autopores and mesopores like we were discussing earlier.
familiar with the polymorphic species. In this whole order, Trepostomata, are polymorphic and they include both autopores and mesopores, and they also include what's called acanthopores. Acanthopores, instead of hosting zooids, actually host spines, and so they're a little bit different than the auto-mesopores, but they're still an extra feature that are really helpful in determining what you're looking at when you're looking at a fossil bryozoan. And so the presence of all three of these Pore types or zoichia types is a distinct classification of trepostomes. Additionally, trepostomes have what's called diaphragms. Diaphragms are short horizontal dividing walls within the autopore tubes or the tubes that host the zooid individuals. So these horizontal dividing walls are shown in this figure to the right, and we can see that in the genus Prasopora, we have the diaphragms labeled here, these horizontal walls, and this is a section taken from a cut of this guy right up here to the left along this cut right here and we can see all the diaphragms in its image and then we also have a longitudinal section of the genus Decayella at the bottom and this also shows diaphragms in its autopore tubes but we can't see them in their sections that are cut differently than the long sections. So E and H represent the transverse sections of these genera and we can't see the horizontal dividing tubes or the diaphragms because we're looking at them head on. However we do see in the pictures that are had on the different pore types or zoichia types. These are shown in between the main autopores. We see that there are mesopores that are smaller and a little bit more angular, and then we have acanthopores that are really tiny in between the junctions of the main autopores, and these are what host spines. Another distinguishing feature in a lot of these trepostomes is their monticules, which are little bumps on their surface. And here is a real life example of some trepostome fossils. We have these bumpy examples or examples with monticules. And if we looked really closely and cut them in certain sections, we could see some of the structures we were mentioning earlier. The next order we'll talk about is the cryptostomes. The cryptostomes also went from the Ordovician to the Permian and they're characterized by short autopores, so not super long zooid tubes, which have a wider opening called a vestibule with a hemiseptum that separates the vestibule from the inner zoechium. So that's a lot of terminology there, but basically what this means is that the autopores, which are labeled up here showing the tubes where the zooids would have been during the bryozoan's life, these have vestibules or just wider parts at their surface, and then they abruptly get narrow as you go down the tube. And so what happens here is that this abrupt narrowing of this pathway is cut by a hemiseptum. So you can see it's wider and then boom, it cut a little bit, but it's not cut all the way through. And this is why this septum is called hemiseptum instead of just septum, um, because it doesn't go all the way and then it cuts it to make it narrower and then it just keeps going. So that's what all that means. And that's a typical characteristic of cryptosomes. And so that's really helpful for identification if you are able to get a thin section longitudinal cut of this animal, but if you're not, then there are some other characteristics that you can look for. Similarly to the trepostomes, they have diaphragms that are horizontal dividing walls in their autopores, and also they have mega and micro acanthopores. Basically, they have mega acanthopores, which are bigger spikes or ridges, and then they have tiny spikes or ridges also, and these are called micro acanthopores. And so this is what you might be able to notice without a thin section in the fossil just with your eyes, especially the mega acanthophores because they form these ridges. And so looking for that would be helpful in identifying these types of bryozoans in the fossil record. So moving on to Fenestrata. Fenestrata are well named because an easy way to remember these guys is that they're kind of like lacy fans. And I like that the order itself starts with an S because it helps me remember that Fenestrates are fan-like. And additionally, their name actually means windows. And so we can see if we look at the top left of the figure, there's what's called the finistrule, which is the first thing labeled on these bryozoans. And these finistrules are these little windows. And we can also see them in this image. They're just like these tiny little holes. You can see them in this image. In figure E, there are also these holes. It's just a 
more zoomed out version. Um, but yeah, these little finish rules are the windows uh, that these finish rates got their name from. Additionally, these finish rates are exclusively encrusting organisms, meaning that they encrust on other surfaces, whether that be rocks or other organisms, and they encrust in a very specific way. To do this, they have one side that's different than the other. Their side that faces down is called their obverse side, and this side has little spines and is where they have their autopores, or zoechia. And then on their reverse side, that's the side facing out, it does not have those same characteristics in an evolutionary attempt to try and protect themselves. And so their bottom side is really what hosts all their more vulnerable parts, and then their upper side is kind of a protective layer, if you will, of just their calcified zoarium. Some additional characteristics that are labeled up here that are important to know are their decepiments, which are these little separations between their finished rules, which don't actually host any zooids with zoechia or anything. They're just these separations between finished rules. And then we have acanthopores again, which is what we talked about in previous orders as well. And these host the spines. And then another thing that you might hear is the part of the animal that contains the zoechia that hosts the zooids is called the branches, distinguishing it from the decepiments. Lastly, we'll just go over some of the differences in morphology that this fan-like order can take on. As we see in this picture, we can see that it can just be pretty much flat fan-like structure that encrusts other organisms, kind of like the picture that we saw in the very first slide of this presentation. Additionally, they can also kind of twist in a screw-like structure, which we saw on the very second slide of this presentation. And this screw-like structure is typical of the genus Archimedes. Archimedes is extinct, like the entire order of Fenestrata, but the genus Archimedes itself is very specific of the Mississippian period, making it a really helpful index fossil for this time range. Again, here are some real life pictures of Archimedes to the right and one of the more general fan-like encrusting structures of fenestrates on the left. Now moving to Cyclostomata. Cyclostomata is an order that went from the early Ordovician to recent. This is the only order of the class Stenolemata that actually isn't extinct, and it's one of the three common orders of bryozoa that we find on Earth today. We'll talk about the other two in a little bit, but basically this order is also called Tuvula parata, and it was a minor group in the Paleozoic, unlike the other orders of Stenolemata. However, it survived the Permian, also unlike the other orders we've talked about, and it thrived after the Triassic. Additionally, this order can either be erect or encrusting. We can see some examples on the right of a close-up microscopic image of a species of this order, and then we see a similar structure zoomed out on the bottom right picture shown where it is encrusting on what I think is a brachiopod shell. The last order that is part of the Stenolemata class is called Cystoporata. The Cystoporates went from the early Ordovician to the Triassic. This one didn't survive until now. It did go extinct in the Triassic. However, it did survive the Permian extinction, which is what the first three orders we went over did not do. So it was unique in that it survived the Permian, but in the Triassic it did go extinct. However, they were similar to cyclostomes in morphology, all except for the fact that they had curved partitions called cystiframs that separated their zoechia. Some also had crescentic projections called lunaria around their apertures. Some pictures of cystoporates include this zoomed out picture and this zoomed in picture. I wanted to include the thin section here because if you just look at this thin section compared to some of the others we were looking at, like the trepostomes and cryptostomes, you can clearly see that there's a more irregular structure with the cystoporates, and they just look a lot different than those first two classes that also had these branching-like structures. Moving on to the class Gymnolemata. Gymnolemata includes the order Stenostomata and Chelostomata, but starting with the Stenostomes, this order went from the Ordovician to recent, and so therefore it is around today and still living. However, the Stenostomes rarely fossilize, and therefore their fossil record really just sucks. They do, however, sometimes leave behind traces by encrusting or boring into other organisms. For example, here in the picture on the right, we see a zoomed in image where the scale here is three millimeters on this, I think, brachiopod, I'm going to assume, uh, where we see these trace fossils of where something was kind of encrusted on this organism. And so this is an example of the kind of fossils you would have to use to identify stenosomes in the fossil
fossil record. Moving to chelostomes, we have time range of Jurassic to recent. A little bit different than a lot of the others. They didn't start in the Ordovician, rather they started in the Jurassic. And this actually led to them having a huge diversification or what we call radiation in biology during the Cretaceous, right after the Jurassic when they evolved. And so after the Cretaceous, they had just a huge amount of morphological diversity and they still do today. And so for this reason, there's really no one picture that I can show you that kind of shows the general morphological structure of chelostomes. They're just too diverse to really nail down one example of them. But I show this picture again because this is the one we used to show the little autopores in this zoomed out version earlier. And so this is actually an example of a chelostome. And these guys are named for their lip mouth because they have an operculum on each of their zoechia. And what that means is just they have this like cap structure. If you remember from the slide where we had all the structures labeled, operculum was one of those labels on the zooid capsule thing. And to show the example of what these chelostomes would look like in a zoomed in image in life, you can see this beautiful picture here showing their beautiful lophophores blooming out of their autopores and working to bring water into their mouths and filter feed through their ciliated tentacles. And this is just an incredible microscopic image showing this animal in real life, and I thought it was really cool to include. So now to talk about bryozoan evolution throughout the Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Just to recap, we had the orders of the class Stenolaemata, so trepostomes, cryptostomes, fenestrates, cyclostomes, and cystophorates, all evolving in the Ordovician period, as well as the stenostomes of the Gymnolaemata class. Then we had the trepostomes, cryptostomes, and fenestrates go extinct at the Hermotriassic extinction. However, the cystoporates and cyclostomes of the Stenolaemata class and the stenostomes of the Gymnolaemata class did survive that extinction event. And then the cystoporates of the Stenolaemata class did go extinct in the Triassic. And then after the Triassic, cyclostomes dominated of the Stenolaemata class. And then if you remember in the Jurassic, we had chelostomes evolve and then the radiation of chelostomes in the Cretaceous. And in the big picture, three of these orders did survive throughout the Cenozoic and to today. That is the cyclostomes of the Stenolaemata class and the chelostomes and stenostomes of the Gymnolaemata class. Additionally, I just wanted to go over some general trends that were seen throughout bryzoan evolution, and this is increased calcification of their skeletons, or zooaria, and then they also had an increased shift to rigid erect species in deeper water rather than encrusting species, and then they had increased depth of zooid tubes, or zooechia, meaning their tubes that hosted their zooids became deeper, probably in response to predation because predators will likely munch off the surface of things and they wanted to go deep into their tube to protect themselves, and then also an increased zooid count in colonies, so the colonies became bigger. That is all for the phylum bryozoans. Please feel free to click down below to see the rest of the paleontology videos, and with that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!